Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries RPG podcast with John and Hannah. Hi. And today, as requested by the people who voted in our Twitter poll, we are going to be looking at another monster from the themed folio, and that is the Lung Wang or Sea Dragon. So first things first, it's 2020. We're both white people who grew up in the British countryside in the 80s and we're looking at the Oriental Adventures book from the 90s. Most of our knowledge of Chinese culture comes from the work of Jackie Chan and yeah. we're probably going to say something wrong. Although, to be fair, I have done a li- I've done a little bit of reading on the, the sort of Chinese mythology just because I'm generally interested in mythology, but we're we're by no means experts. We're not here to insult anyone, and we're going to try and take the same approach with this as we have with other D&D creatures. Yeah. We're going to look at the creature in the books, then we're going to look at some myths and stories that we've not read before in the same way that we did with the Red Caps and some others. And then we're going to look at how we might use them in a and d game. Yeah. We're both a lot more familiar with European myths and with Americana than we are with the rest of the world, and we want to learn more about these other myths. Oh, yeah, I'm always interested in mythology. So, yeah, if we say something that upsets anybody or if we misunderstand something, please correct us because it helps us. Um, So, all of that said, sharing stories is a great way to understand other cultures oh yeah definitely. D&D is a great way to share stories i mean that's how the whole oral sort of history comes down isn't it really so let's look at lung wang in the early D&D. okay so the lung wang first appeared in the AD&D first edition fiend folio it's one of a number of oriental dragons described in that book they're described as varying a great deal from each other, the different subspecies, far more so than the Western-influenced dragons, who tend to just vary in colour and the sort of breath weapons that they wield. Mm-hmm. The powers, as I say, vary widely based on their subspecies. They've all got continual ESP, as per the spell, at a range of five feet per age category. Some of them have a power called Scaly Command, where no scaly, unintelligent creatures that live in water will ever willingly attack them. Others have the power of water fire, where they can, whenever they're touching water or they're underneath water, they can surround themselves with flames that burn magically, inflicting damage on anyone in close proximity. So, the Lung Wang, one of the subspecies, the sea dragon, is described as a solitary, brutish creature that's related to the dragon turtle and appears physically similar, having flippers, a hard outer shell, a sort of vaguely dragon like, sort of turtle like head. They can also breathe a scalding cloud of steam, just like the dragon turtles. They have the scaly command power that I was just talking about. And apparently they're, they're very portrayed as being very sort of territorial. They demand tribute from like every passing ship or traveller. And like ships can be spared if they like dump enough treasure over the side for like the, the um, Lung Wang to let them on their way. Now... Although the Lung Wang get a very brief write-up in the AD&D version of Oriental Adventures, there's also some details provided on the Celestial Bureaucracy, which is referenced in the later third edition of the book that we'll talk about in a bit. The Celestial Bureaucracy is described as a government of spirits presided over by the Celestial Emperor, an immensely powerful spirit being. Spirits, such as the Lung Wang and other creatures, receive assignments from the bureaucracy and have to like file reports on their area of expertise. The Lung Wang are described as being the guardians of sea creatures and aids to the sea lords. We're not given any stats in there and we're simply referred back to the Fiend Folio if you want those stats. And as far as I'm aware, the next appearance of them was in the the sort of third ad version mm-hmm. of Oriental Adventures. In this book, the Lung Wang are listed as sea dragons with the creature subtypes water and spirit. Now, as we've just said, they're described as being part of the celestial bureaucracy, hence the spirit subtype, mm-hmm. a governing body of powerful spirits, each variety with their own task and their area of responsibility. 
as is the case with all of the dragons in this book, they speak draconic and the spirit tongue. As with the Fiend Folio, they're described as relatives of the mighty dragon turtle, although this version of the Long Wang seems to be more nomadic, and they're described as constantly moving around, being able to shift freely between the prime material plane and the elemental plane of water. We're given a table for various different age categories, as with most dragons in 3rd edition, which gives you hit dice, size, armor class, attack bonuses, saves, fear DC, spell resistance, speed, stats, and special abilities. The reasons they give you a fear DC with dragons is because even approaching them or being in their presence in 3rd edition means the lesser creatures have to make a saving throw or flee or become shaken. 3rd edition Lung Wang Dragons still have the steam breath, they can breathe water or air freely, they've got that scaly command power, they're immune to fire, and they have a percentage chance of capsizing large ships, the percentage being based on their age category. Also, once a day they can create a fog cloud with a radius of 50 foot per age category of the dragon. Unlike the Fiend Folio version where it specifies that apart from that they don't have any more sort of magic -y abilities, the th third ed version they can use the following spell-like abilities Obscuring Mist three times a day, Solid Fog once a day and Suggestion once a day. The Lung Dragons were not covered in the third ed Draconomicon which seems a bit of a weird omission mm -hmm. since it was a book all about dragons and as far as I'm aware they've not made it into fourth edition or fifth edition they may do in future i don't know so love you've been looking into more sort of general mythology associated well, with them indeed i have um yeah we we were expecting one of the other dragons to come up and i've been looking at the uh yeah because the celestial dragon, dragon was originally winning general. wasn't it so i'm gonna start out with a little story that i found about Chinese dragons okay. that sort of helps sum up like where they're coming from and why they're different from Western dragons. Okay. So, once upon a time, there's four dragons. Long, yellow, pearl and black. And they live in the sea near the village and they can see that the people in the village are starving. And the dragons go to the Drade Emperor and ask him for help. The Jade Emperor is angry with the dragons because they've left their place and they've disturbed him. Ah, right, okay, so they've left their sort of duties. So he doesn't bother to send rain to the village. And the dragons get a bit annoyed with this and they decide to make the rain themselves so they scoop up the water from the sea and spray it out over the village. And the crops can grow and the people survive. But the Jade Emperor does not like their cheek. Right, I see. So he locks them up each in four different mountains. But the dragons are really glad that they did the right thing and they're okay with being in these prisons. Okay. And that allows them to become the four main rivers in China and they continue to help people by bringing them water. So presumably that's a, a myth to sort of give a give a backstory to like these four great rivers that obviously they relied mm -hmm. upon a great deal back in the day. And the river's names correspond to the names of the dragons, I believe. Although I, I don't speak any Chinese, I'm not even going to try and attempt to. It's, it's interesting, though, because it's got a whole sort of like animistic vibe, hasn't it? You know, mm -hmm. where like everything has a spirit and everything sort of has its place. So, yeah, in Chinese culture, dragons are not flesh and blood animals. The, the dragon shape is just one of many that they can take. Um, and a way to think about it is that some celestial beings have this like dragon form power up and it's like part of the water magic power tree because dragons are almost always associated with water. Yeah, and obviously we saw a, we saw like a bit of a sort of reflection of that when we were saying how in the... Um, in the third ed book they'd added this spirit subtype to them and that's added to a lot of like creatures which otherwise might not have had that mm -hmm. but obviously that sort of spiritual side of things and the sort of the celestial bureaucracy and stuff like that is obviously a greater part of chinese mythology than it is with western mythology so they tweaked that a little bit in the book so they're usually associated with bodies of water okay 
in theory, any river or stream or waterfall could have its own dragon. Yeah. And the dragons help to administer the weather, as I think it mentions somewhere in there about the celestial bureaucracy. Yeah. The idea that the Jade Emperor has all these other spirits doing all the work of keeping the world running for him. Yeah, he sort of subcontracts it down to all yeah, the spirits, it, doesn't he? And the dragons do a lot of that. But there's also um, the four dragon kings, and that is uh, literally Long Wang, which I'm assuming is where Lung Wang comes from in the D&D books. Okay. Uh, Lung or Long meaning dragon. So there's four of these dragon kings. There's one in the East China Sea, there's one in the South China Sea, there's one in the Indian Ocean in the West, and there's one in Lake Bikal in the North. Okay. And these four dragon kings appear in quite a few different bits of mythology. Um, in Journey to the West, the Eastern Dragon King is the one who gives Monkey his staff. Oh, yeah, You know, yeah. the staff that gets big and small. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that staff is made from a pillar of the Eastern Dragon King's palace. All right, okay. Which Monkey nicks and the Dragon King lets him because it'd be too much trouble to try and stop him because it's Monkey. Um, and they're often depicted as these, like, fat, kind noblemen, um, sort of Uncle Iroh-type character again, with these long beards and fine clothes. Hello. And they're often like advisor type characters, but they are definitely more deity than they are creature. Okay. Uh, another good example of them that I could think of would be um, Haku in Spirited Away. Oh, yeah. Um, and the other river spirit in Spirited Away. Um, just as like how they represent that, and obviously they subvert the trope in that film because it's the humans have damaged the river spirit and they need to help heal the river spirit. Yeah. Whereas normally the river spirit accidentally hurts humans and then has to redeem itself. Or that's what happens to the horse in Journey to the West. Um, it's actually a dragon that's trying to redeem itself for eating Tripitaka's horse. Um, there's also... A real world creature called a leafy sea dragon All right. which lives off the coast of Australia and it's a bit like seahorse but it's got all these like extra oh yeah it's got a lot of yeah. fronds on it hasn't it yeah I remember yeah, that yeah. It, it looks like a weird mutant seahorse they look kind of cool but they're like highly endangered and I looked for a couple of things about them and everything seemed to be about one mating pair called Max and Michelle so, so yeah, I'm guessing uh, there's not many of them about at the moment so yeah uh, sea dragons so do we want to talk about how you could possibly use them in games yeah uh, I'm surprised actually at how much of what I've been able to find out and Granted, I've only had like a few hours of researching this um, about the actual myth without me having read any of the monster stuff. Yeah. I, I'm surprised by how much of the monster stuff they've tried to sort of make it work as a monster in a game, but also have it have aspects of the actual Chinese mythology. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah having the whole um, being able to disappear off to other worlds and that kind of thing. Although, fundamentally, they have just made them be a great big solid animal instead of a divine being. Well, I mean, I don't know about that, because like I say, they, they did have the spirit subtype to it, mm -hmm. which I, I can't remember the exact sort of fullness of what the spirit subtype gives you, but it does sort of put them in that sort of one foot in the material, one foot in the sort of metaphysical or spiritual sort of realm. So I, I think it seems to me like they obviously didn't want to go the whole hog and say, yeah, they're full spirit creatures. But 
because obviously they wanted you to be able to interact with them because obviously it's D&D &D. at the end of the day yeah. it's a game about like fighting monsters and getting treasure and stuff like that so they still wanted you to be able to interact with them whereas if they're entirely spirits you know it's great for mythology obviously but it's not so great from a game perspective so I think they sort of certainly in the third edition uh, Oriental Adventures they went for like a compromise solution where they're like mm. oh yeah well they are still like physical creatures but we'll also give them this spirit subtype and we'll give some of them the ability to like skip off to other like planes and stuff like that so i think they were trying to sort of pay lip service to the mythology but also still keep in mind that it's a game if you can't interact mm. with these monsters there's no point in having them in the game something else that i noticed is that what i was researching tended to depict the um long the long wang as being either these like chubby fat friendly guys yeah or as being um the sort of long thin you know sort of falcor type dragon whereas the D, &D books have gone very much more for the sort of like the lion turtle from avatar where it's an enormous turtle yeah yeah i'm just interested as to how that's ended up happening i'm not really sure to be honest i mean i suppose it depends on what sort of strands they were sort of pulling from when they were creating the book but i'd be very surprised if a large part of it didn't figure into the fact that they were like well we've already got like 101 different types of dragon dragon mm -hmm. so just like adding in some more dragons and going oh they're a bit more snake like doesn't really like add a great deal whereas if you throw stuff in and you're like oh it's like a giant turtle or it's like a giant lion thing but it's a dragon it seems a lot more sort of interesting and i suppose exotic which obviously like clearly they're sort of playing on in that book as far as using it in games go yeah i would say what you should ask yourself before you put this in your game is if this was a western fantasy setting have you got something to say about it Oh, no, no, you're quiet now, I've asked you. Typical. <laughs> well, that's told me. Go on, then. So, what you should ask yourself is, if this was a Western fantasy game, would I put an angel in here? Okay. If the answer's yes, then, yeah, by all means, use the Lung Wang. It's like this quality spiritual being that would be able to do anything in an Eastern setting game that an angel would do for you narratively in a Western setting game. Yeah, I mean, I think personally, I think one of the most interesting aspects of it is this whole thing of the dragons, although they're sort of like big cogs, they are still like cogs in this like celestial bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And I think certainly if you if you wanted to have your your mythology of your campaign world or whatever reflect that i think that could be a lot more interesting and a bit more novel than the standard like oh yeah here's a smattering of gods and they've got angels and demons or whatever as servants i think if you said to said to your players i mean as long as they roll up for it if you said to your players like oh yeah there's this whole like vast celestial machine that governs my campaign world and there's all these different spirits and dragons are just sort of like the head honchos almost of this sort of celestial bureaucracy you could get quite a lot of interest out of that and i said earlier about this sort of animist sort of idea and obviously we, we mentioned like genius loci before you know like the spirit of a place i think you could get a great deal of use out of these type of dragons as that so you know you go to you go to like a sea or something and let's say you're fighting against pirates on these seas maybe you're hired by like the plump man who later turns out to be like the dragon in charge of that bit of the sea and he was like oh, i need to get rid of these pirates but i can't just really get my dragon on and go and like smash them down because that's that's going to cause too many like problems however if i hire some adventurers to go and do it for me maybe give a bit of cheeky help here and there i think that could be a more interesting way of presenting like a fairly sort of standard you know like person hires you to do this sort of mission the thing that i thought of when i was looking into all of this as like a way you could use the dragon kings would be to use them in the same way that the actual wizard is used in the wizard of oz 
in that there's like this big build up to go and get to him. Yeah. And the the characters are sort of half convinced that he can solve all of their problems. He can't actually solve all of their problems, but he sort of gives them agency to be able to go and do that themselves. The answer was inside you all along. Exactly. That that's the sort of story I think they should be used for. Well, that's it. I mean, I. I like as well, like, you know, like the whole bit, um, there's the old guy in um, Gremlins who, like, solves mm-hmm. them like the Mogwai. Mm-hmm. And he sort of, like, he, he doesn't initially want to solve them the Mogwai. Like, the guy steals it. Right. So, like, he doesn't appear and go, oh, have this, it's going to get you into some trouble. He has this thing, and he's like, no, you don't want to mess with that. Mm-hmm. It's going it, it, it's, it's to cause you trouble. Leave it. But, like, the guy, through his, like, own greed, ignores that guy's advice takes that takes that thing and the whole like thing about like you know oh don't feed after midnight don't get it wet whatever it all happens as a result of his greed and not listening to this old man i quite like the idea of like the long wang or one of the other dragons of this type perhaps like you say in that sort of friendly human form sort of having something and maybe player characters being player characters they break in they take it and it's only later they realize that like oh he wasn't just some like fat merchant who was like telling some stories about this like box he's got. Or there actually is some like serious like curse or something going on with it. And then they sort of have to work out like, well, can we get rid of it? Or do we go back to that guy and be like, oh yeah, our bad. Sorry, we like took your box. Can you help us out? And then maybe he can say like, oh, well, I will help you out. But if you do this for me and it could lead into other missions. So... I quite like the idea of not really like penalising players for like standard sort of player character behaviour in D&D, but like having a creature that seems like it's wise and it's not just trying to get at the player characters, but, you know, when he's almost trying to teach them a lesson through their own hubris, Mm -hmm. like you were saying, you know, you, through this like trial, you learn something about yourself you maybe learn that, like, oh, yeah, you know, if only I hadn't been as greedy at the start and I'd have just actually listened, maybe I'd have been in a better place. But now I know and I can carry that lesson forward. So I think that would be... I think it would be difficult to do, depending on your group, but I think it could be interesting. I mean, I think, obviously, with the Lung Wang, because it's, like, depicted as related to, like, the Dragon Turtles, you can use it for anything you can use a Dragon Turtle for. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like, surfacing under ships, capsizing them and stuff like that. If you want to go on that Avatar The Last Airbender riff, you've got the whole bit where you go like, oh, there's an island, but it's moving towards us. And like the head's underwater or whatever, mm-hmm. and it rises up at the last minute. So I think you could do anything you could do with like a big sea monster with the long wang. But obviously it's also got this sort of kicker that it's like a very intelligent, organised, orderly creature. It's not some chaotic monster thrashing around. Mm-hmm. So I think another potentially interesting story you could do is like, what if a, a Lung Wang turns up at a settlement, like a coastal settlement, and starts trashing it? And you think, oh, it's just a monster. You go and investigate. Well, then you find out it's this like normally peaceful, wise, calm, spiritual creature, and that perhaps it's got a good reason for for attacking the settlement. Maybe there's some evil shenanigans going on in there, and it like it's just trying to stop it, but it doesn't have the means to do so. So it's like attacking the town to try and draw attention to it which has obviously worked because the player characters are there maybe maybe it's been controlled by someone or maybe it's been given orders to do this from like the celestial bureaucracy even though it disagrees with it for some reason because for some reason known only to the jade emperor this settlement has to be swept away for some reason and it, as a player if you find out that like the jade emperor has like signed something and sealed the order to take out this town what do you do because like if you even if you defeat the Lung Wang, the Jade Emperor, if he wants that town destroyed, he's not going to go. Oh, you've defeated my dragon. Oh well, my bad. <laughs> he's going to be like, oh, let me just look at my roller decks of like spirits I've got here and like send another one down. So again, I think it'd be a great creature to use for having like almost like an ethical dilemma in a game. Mm. But you've still got that element of like, yeah, there's a giant monster in it, so it still feels like D and D. But you can just add a little extra wrinkle and like maybe like make the storyline a bit deeper and a bit more nuanced. Mm-hmm. See, it's not a setting I've ever really looked at before. And I must admit, is now the time to eviscerate the books? It's not a book, it's a piece of paper. Well, it's like a plastic bag. All right. 
Good girl. See, I'm not really looked at the Oriental Adventures setting before at all. Yeah. And I must admit, looking through it, it does sound like quite a cool creature. I'd definitely be interested in playing an adventure that had it in. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I think there's... I think the the link to like the celestial bureaucracy and the fact that a lot of creatures are classified as spirits, and obviously we don't mean spirits in the way as like ghosts or whatever. We mean spirits more in the case of like natural spirits, spirits of location and stuff like that. I think that's certainly a very interesting concept, and it's something that I've not seen in too many settings. Mm. Now, obviously, this is like a fictionalized version. It's not true to the actual mm-hmm. mythology, but I think so using this as a starting point, maybe doing a bit of your research as we said earlier you could certainly end up with a far more intriguing pantheon and -hmm. something a bit different than the standard oh yeah here's a smattering of different gods because how much cooler is it rather than to be like oh here's another generic god of the sea he's a beardy man with a trident and he controls the waves To, to be like oh yeah there's there's four different seas in this setting and each of them has like a dragon king who's like rules over it and they report into the the jade emperor like gives them their orders and stuff i think that sounds far cooler than like another generic poseidon knockoff absolutely so that's been our episode on the lung wang the sea dragon if you've got any comments or thoughts on this please feel free to get in touch or if you've got any suggestions as to monsters you'd like to see us cover in the future you can get in touch with us by leaving a voicemail message using speakpipe there's a link in the description of this episode or you can send us an email to rdrpgpodcast at gmail.com until we see you next time take care stay safe and keep gaming bye